Anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn this over to uh, Anthony, Anthony, uh, Kilo 8, Zulu Tango. Anthony, I can't, I'm not sure exactly on, on your last name, so I'm not going to butcher it or anything. How no, does pro that? no problem. It's, it's, it's a Luskery, but uh, it, it's, it's a tw tongue twister for people that I don't have to worry about knowing when someone calls me on the phone whether they know me or not. So, oh. Well, thank you all for uh, inviting me this evening. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be on QRP, amateur radio, and introduction. Um, and the slideshow is available at tiny.cc slash QAR, QRP, amateur radio. And uh, the reason why I make that available is you'll want to be able to click on the links. Anywhere you see this little link symbol will be an active link in the slideshow. Uh, this is a link to my webpage where I have a number of things on QRP and a bunch of other things also on contesting, DXing, uh, maps, etc. So my webpage at kzt.com. So the definition of QRP uh, in the QR codes is QRP with a question mark means shall I decrease my transmit power. And the statement QRP means please decrease your transmit power or I have decreased my transmit power. And uh, th that's the formal Q code, but what it in general means in amateur radio operations is it's referred to as usually 5 watts or less output power from the transmitter on HF bands. Um, usually the recognized value for contesting categories and awards is 5 watts, although a few uh, clubs use 10 watt PEP on single sideband and they call that QRP, but most of the award sponsors stick to the 5 watts. Uh, QRPP uh, means even lower power level, and it's often called milliwatting and usually uses l less than one watt of output power. Uh, a funny little uh, side incident is many QRP operators send the number 72 instead of 73 after two-way QRP contacts, denoting the reduced power. They reduce the number by one. <laughs> so why did I personally choose QRP? Well, there's really four different reasons. It's accidental. I didn't know any better, a.k.a. novices shouldn't start with QRP. Uh, didn't get to me in time. Uh, the cost, and more on that later. Uh, a previous teenage obsession, which I'll talk about in a little more detail with the 10 Tech Power Might series. And I also have a presentation that talks about that called the Odyssey of the Argonauts. I'm going to be doing that uh, next Saturday for the um, Long Island CW Club for their Boat Anchors uh, Saturday show. And the fourth one is prevention of RFI. Uh, my first shack was in a duplex, and my neighbor uh, was nice enough to let me attach my dipole to one corner of his roof, run it out to a 19-foot pole in the backyard on a little hill, and then use twin lead to feed it into my house through the, um, the laundry room. So I was always worried about uh, Q uh, RF uh, interfering with my neighbor's uh, electronics in his house during the 1980s. So uh, QRP was a good thing for that. So let's look at uh, some other things. So I had read an article in CQ Magazine about QRP. I had also um, then subscribed to the QRP ARCI quarterly by joining the QRP ARCI group, the U.S. Uh, QRP club, the pretty much the biggest one. And then I also started getting a, I joined the group called the GQRP club, and I started getting their publication of Sprat. I also read a book by Aid Weiss uh, called the, the Joy of QRP, which is a little picture of there. And um, once I realized what could be done with QRP, I was sort of hooked on the idea of operating QRP. Um, each of these two clubs I belong to uh, gives out numbers. So I'm 1417 in the GRP club, and I'm 5117 in the QRP ARCI group. The accidental part of it is I didn't know any better. I guess I hadn't listened to the advice of Mother Hams that novice shouldn't, shouldn't start with QRP, uh, the saying that life is too shoot for, short for QRP, and that real amateurs always have RF burns, and many other uh, negative comments about QRP that I've heard over the years. Um, why do others choose QRP? Well, some people choose it for the lower cost, at least potentially. Some of the radio equipment's less expensive. Uh, the power supplies, you don't need 20 watts of power supply. You can get by with a 5 watt. 5 amp power supply, uh, feed line and coax switches can be minimal, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, heavy duty uh, use, and your electric bill can be a little bit lower. By the way, um, 
I visited the contest superstation of K3LR, and I think he said they average about $35 to $40 on the give, on the CQ Worldwide weekends uh, running their six amps and all their transceivers. So uh, I feel like it's money in the bank with my QRP signal. Uh, Let's go back a little bit to before I had my license. Uh, I was interested in amateur radio, but no success in licensing. I was a teenager who liked science and geography, uh, Boy Scouts and camping, and I saw an advertisement in a magazine for the Tentec Power Might, and I thought that would be a great radio to have that I could take camping with me. And I read about amateur radio, but I didn't know how to get my license. I had no Elmer to help me out, and I really didn't know what you needed to do. So college uh, eventually and career marriage intervened, and I never did get my license. And one day my wife saw an article in the local newspaper about a novice class being held in our area. And she said, well, didn't you always want to do that? And I said, yes. I said, why don't you come with me? So we ended up as K8NRC and K8ODP uh, 41 years ago in 1981. Well, the power mic that I was dreaming about as a teenager, this is a picture of it. It was a, uh, a, a, a all solid state radio, which is pretty rare at the time in the 70s, late 70s, and uh, it ran about two watts of power. In 1970, uh, I had a paper route, and at 15 cents per customer per week with 60 customers, that meant I grossed about $9 a week. Uh, the power mic, unfortunately, cost $54. So uh, it was about a half a year's income on my paperboy route, and uh, so no power might for me at that time. I eventually did get them after I got my license. I got them on the used market. Um, why do some other people choose KRP? Well, less RFI. Uh, you don't have to worry so much about the RF health exposures, and it's very easy to do homebrew equipment. You don't need high-voltage circuits for it. Another reason that people do QRP is for the challenge. The same reason people white water raft uh, do... Uh, track and field, uh, archery, fly fishing, mountain climbing, and marathons, all for the challenge. There's much easier ways to go 26 miles. Uh, there's much easier ways to catch fish. Uh, so it's the challenge, the challenge in the awards, the contest, and the personal challenge of operating with low power. Now, why do others choose QRP? It's similar to the question, why do I fly fish? There's much more efficient ways to catch fish. and Coincidentally, I enjoyed fly fishing as a teenager also. I haven't fly fished for quite a while, but I enjoyed, that's the type of fishing that I did. So even just as in uh, amateur radio where you see posters that say life is too short for QRP, I guess the same thing happens in the fishing hobby. And people say, do not consider fly fishing. There are far easier ways to catch fish. So I guess QRP operators are sort of like the fly fishers of fishing. And there is no one type of QRP operation. There's QRP operators have a bunch of personalities, and some of them have multiple personalities, but I broke it down into five different groups. And as I said earlier, some people will cross over between these groups, but a lot of people uh, can be very much identified by one of these groups. And I'm going to identify them as the minimalist, the builders, the experimenters and designers, uh, portable operators, and the last group I'm going to refer to as optimized station operators. And I'll describe each of those in the next couple slides, hopefully. So QRP minimalist, they want low power, very simple radios and very simple antennas. Um, there was an article in many of the QRP journals in the late, in the early 80s about the one incher, basically a radio built on a one inch uh, circuit board with uh, one transistor output on it. Uh, then there's the builders out there. Building is their main pleasure. Uh, although they'll operate occasionally, they actually enjoy building more than they probably even enjoy op uh, operating the radios they build. Uh, with QRP, it's much easier and safer to build QRP rate transmitters. You don't have to worry about the high voltage, and it's a lot easier to build in a lot of cases. So a lot of builders enjoy building QRP radios. Often use simple circuits, homebrew, or some of them also assemble kits. And there's something called the Altoid crowd, and they like to build little radios and little accessories in the Altoid mint cans, canisters. And operating is a secondary thought to these type of builders. Some other builders are builders and designers. They don't only want to build projects, they want to design projects. And QRP is a great place to do that because it's very easy to experiment at a lower cost and with uh, lower um, level components. Very common now, a lot of the QRP designs incorporate microcontroller devices. This is the circuit board for the QCX from Hans um, and QRP Labs. 
and notice that it's incorporating a microprocessor and a little digital display and uh, doing a, this is a single band um, CW only radio with a display and decoder even built into it. So a lot of times you'll see QRP builders using Arduinos, basic stamps, Raspberry Pi, and uh, sometimes the radios are very sophisticated, but that's because they can combine these different modules. Um, this is an example of radio that was built as a kit. This is the Elecraft K2. I had one of those. I've sold mine now. I have a, some other Elecraft radios that have replaced it. Then the next group of operators are the QRP group, portable operators. They like small radios. Weight is very important to them. And low power output equals a low battery, which means lower weight. So uh, a lot of the people like to operate QRP because they don't want to lug a giant battery wire with them. Portable antennas are common, simple wires are verticals, and the POTA and SOTA groups, uh, especially the SOTA who climb the, the, the summits, like, like the low, po low power because of its low weight and low battery requirements. requirements. There's also a group that call, of pedestrian mobile operators. Now, some of them don't operate QRP. Some of them operate QRO. But the problem, again, goes back to that battery thing. If you're going to have a QRO radio on your back, you're going to have to have a rather big battery. And also, there's the whole idea of uh, 100 watts up against the side of the back of your head uh, for RF exposure. Pedestrian mobile means that you're operating mobile without the vehicle. So you're able to be on the move and operating. Uh, a lot of them use something called the buddy pole antenna. They might use whips or magnetic loops. And some of them use military backboards. Uh, the Alice board was very common. And some of them use hip packs and backpacks. And I've done a whole thing on portable operations. Again, I'll give you links to all my slide shows and vi video recordings at the end of today's session. But I have a whole one on portable operations. And then the last group is something called QRP power. In other words, 5 watts or less, but optimize everything else. So this group has no problem using 5 watts with the best possible antennas, towers, beams, etc. Using full featured radios, all the accessories, and power consumption is not a concern. So we're only concerned about the output power, not how much power we might consume in the process of putting that signal out. And a lot of these uh, are the QRP operators who like to also contest in DX. And I guess I'd put myself in this category as my main mode of operation. Although I do build some things and I operate portable, I still like to use optimal to optimize radios like the KX3 or the K2 um, in my use. So there's a number of QRP myths. The first myth is you must use a QRP only radio. The second one is you must use CW only. The second one is you can't possibly win contests. The third one is you can't use beams or good antennas. Uh, the next one is you cannot work DX. And finally, you must use QRP all the time. These are all myths, and I'm going to go through disproving those in the next few slides. First one, that you must use QRP only radio. Most 100 watt radios can be adjusted for lower power operation, so you don't need to have a new radio to be able to operate QRP, although it is fun to always get a new radio. Uh, follow the manufacturer's suggestions on how to turn down the power. Uh, sometimes it means adjusting the ASC, ALC or turning down the drive, etc. For further precise power reductions, you can also use things such as step attenuators. And a lot of people that operate the very low power uh, use step attenuators to reduce their transmit signal uh, from one watt even down to a tenth of a watt. You must use CW only. Although a majority of the QRP operators historically used CW, many also use single sideband. It, there is no question, though, that it's easier to make a CW contact in most cases with lower power than it is to make a single sideband contact. But that's also true with 100 watts. Recent popularity of weak signal di digital modes such as JT65, FT8, and FT4 have become very popular with the QRP operators as they have with the rest of the operators. And these, these modes work very well with QRP. You can't win contests. Well, the nice thing about most contests is that they have separate categories for QRP operators. So you can actually win contests. And I'll move my head aside here so you can see on the wall behind me my, actually, that's hard to do. My, uh, QR, my QRP level uh, CQ Worldwide trophies on the wall behind me. And there's some more on the other walls that you can't see. So you're competing in a different category. You can't use beams or other good antennas. You certainly can. Nothing about low power means that you can't uh, have a high gain antenna. 
Don't confuse low power with poor signals. On like high power amps, the gain of an antenna benefits you twice, once on transmit and once again on receive. Next myth is that you must use QRP all the time. Well, no, there's some people that use kilowatts and QRP at different times, depending on what they're doing. So if they might go out and operate SOTA or POTA using a QRP radio, but might have a full power limit amp in the, in the shack, and they might contest a DX that way. A lot of QR operators find QRP especially enjoying um, after working QRP, QR or the challenge of operating portable with batteries in the field uh, can be very uh, enlightening. You cannot work DX with QRP. Well, that's a myth that I'll definitely say that it's, it's not true. Maybe you will not be the first to break the pile up, but with patience and good operating practices, you can work plenty of DX. Contest or FT8 are good chances for increasing your DX numbers. I originally got into contesting for the purpose of increasing my DXCC totals. Eventually, I got to the point where I wasn't getting any new countries in contests because I had already gotten quite a few. So then I started actually thinking more about the competition of contest. And my current totals are coming up a little later. Oh, here they are right here. So my current operating results. I have DXCC mixed. Uh, my total is now 327. I worked Mount Athos the, on December 31st, finish up Europe, uh, and to add a new country to my DXCC. 306 of those are confirmed. I uh, worked all states on 11 bands, 160 through 6 meters. I uh, worked all zones. Uh, ITU zone 76 out of 77. I'm still missing one to ITU, ITU zone. I have to double check with this, but I know it's in Southeast Asia. Um, I, IOTAs, I have 422 islands on the air. Uh, DXCC challenge, I just passed 1,500 last year, and I passed 1,600 this year. Uh, grids, I had 2,127 of the uh, 2 by 2 grids. And 50 megahertz VUCC, I just got over 250 last year, and I'm up to 270. You can see my totals per bands. Uh, as, you would, as you would expect with QRP, uh, my higher numbers are on the higher frequencies where QRP was much more effective than it is on the lower bands. So you see that I have in the 200s on 20 through 10 meters, and I'm gradually working my total up on 160, but I'm just using a 60-foot uh, sloper off my, my uh, tower here for 160. So I don't have a killer antenna, but I'm still racking up stations short, um, slowly but surely on 160. Uh, this is kind of hard to read, but this basically says that on the states A, K through M, S, in other words, the first 25 states, you can see I have 160 to 6 meters. I've worked all of them. Not in all, all modes, but uh, I've worked them all at least on one mode. And the same thing with the other half, other 25 states. So I've got all 50 states with uh, 5 watts or less on all 11 bands. It's funny the stations that I work. I keep I keep a very um, very detailed log, and I also analyze my data quite a bit, just to look at things like which are the most common uh, DX stations that I work. And you notice the the mix is a little bit different depending on what mode I'm operating. The next myth is that you must operate CW only. Although a majority of QRP operators uh, use CW, many use single sideband. I already had this slide. And here's my QSO per year by band and mode. And you'll see that I, one of the things I'm a firm believer in is if you want to work DX and if you want to get worked all states and things like that, don't limit yourself to one mode. So I'm always about any mode that gets me a new contact, whether it's CW, single sideband, digital, um, any mode, I will try it out. And uh, you can see my yearly uh, by year changes here in the different modes I operate. Some of it's sunspot cycle driven, some of it's also driven by some changes in uh, some of the modes available. Like pre-2015, I was about 60% CW, about 36% uh, phone, and the rest was radio teletype. Well, something happened in 2015, 2016, I started using FT8. Actually, I originally started using JT65, then FT8, then FT4. So you see that when you look at my totals uh, for 2019, both FT4 and FT8 have made a significant dent into my uh, modes of operation. 
Um, one other myth is that QRP is only possible on the H upper HF bands. It's certainly much easier, but 40 meters is actually the favorite band of many QRPers that aren't that interested in DX, but are interested in just making a number of contacts. And uh, you can make contacts on 160. Some of the keys are you're pretty much forced to work CW on 160 because that's where a lot more of the contests take place. There's only one really contest per year that's 160 only in single sideband, and that is the CQ uh, 160 contest coming up in about a month or so here. But that's when I make quite a bit of my uh, contacts on uh, 160 is during contest. Another great thing is FT8. I had a streak last year uh, during the winter time of almost every night for two weeks, I got a new country on FT8. So my first radio, when I got my uh, license in 1981, um, that power might obsession was still in the back of my head. So I looked at looked for the power might, but it was long gone. And even a successor of the 10 Tech 505 and 509 were gone. The radio that was available new at that time was the 10 Tech Argonaut 515. And I decided to buy one. It was just a little under $300. And here it is. I still have it. I'm never going to get rid of it. And uh, it still operates just fine. It puts out about 2 watts on both single sideband and CW. It's got 80 through 10. And uh, over the years, I added things such as extra filtering and uh, accessories. And I still pull it out every once in a while and operate with it. I don't do as much now with it as I did in the past. But for a number of years, it was my full station was in this little box. When I lived in the apartment, I could pick it up and carry it onto the operating table, plug it in, uh, hook up the antenna and operate. When I was done, I'd put it back away in the closet. I made a similar real case for my 817 when I got it. I was living in a house by then, but it, I was just used to that nice compact way of uh, packaging things. So my third generation was uh, the K Aircraft K2. Uh, so after the Argonaut and the 817, my main QRP radio at that point in time became the K2. And I love my K2 and I brought it out in the for field day. This is at Acadia National Park in Maine. I'm sitting on one rock and I have my uh, go box sitting on the other one. You can also see the 817 is also in this box. And by this time, I have computer interfacing. When I first got my K2, every year they'd have different modules available, and I kept adding modules, and I kept bugging Wayne and Eric saying, I need an interface module so I can do contesting. And they didn't think QRP operators would want that, but I really did so that it would track the radio and you allow me to do computer control. And here I am on Acadia. I was the first station in the US during field day to have the sun strike me. I wasn't the furthest east, but because of the combination of being quite far east and being up on a mountain, up on Cadillac Mountain in Acadia National Park, I was the first station to have sunlight. Um, my go box changed over the years. With, when the KX3 came out, I built a go box in another little Plano uh, tackle box. And this front panel snaps off, and it's very easy to operate. Open the top, turn it on, and I'm ready to operate. I have a lithium-ion battery in the top. I'm sorry, lithium fer ferric battery in the top and other accessories. And uh, this is my rapid deployed tackle box. And as I mentioned earlier, these links do take you out to other slideshows or other materials. So here's a presentation on the KX3 rapid deploy tackle box and how I build it and uh, some of the things about it. So... So some of the QRP rig milestones, these aren't all radios that I'm necessarily on. These are radios that have influenced the field of QRP. The Tentec PowerMite series and the pr pr process precursor module series, there was a number of modules that you could build your own PowerMite if you bought the modules. And then the Argonaut 505 was a very important change. It was a, it was a multi-band, multi-mode, uh, under 5-watt QRP, all solid state radio in the 1970s. And it was uh, followed by the 509 and 515, which each had uh, improvements over time. They used the PTO and, uh, and had analog dials. That should be analog as opposed to analogy. And the Heath, Heath kit uh, HW7, HW8, and HW9 were very, very uh, important radios in the QRP history. The Tentec Argosy was a radio that had a switch on the back that you could switch between 5 and 50 watts. It was a multi-band, single sideband CW uh, radio, basically uh, something that followed the Argonauts. 
There was also a number of Japanese radios that were produced in the 80s and early 90s for the amateur radio operators in Japan that were limited to 10 watts. So many of the radios that we had here, like the ICOM, I'm sorry, the uh, the Kenwood 4, uh, I'm going to get the model number now, 450, I think it was, and uh, 440 and 430, all those radios had in the Yaesu, um FT-101, all those had 10-watt versions back in Japan. Most of them never made their way to the U.S., but there were a number of them out there. Uh, the Yaesu FT-817, when it came out, all-in-one box, QRP, uh, HF, VHF, and UHF was really a big change that happened. And ICOM followed very quickly on that step with the ICOM 703. Um, the Tentec Argonaut morphed into the Tentec Argonaut 2 and had digital display and it had a regular v type of VFO as opposed to a PTO. And then there was substantial models after that, the 5 and the 6. The Hellcraft K2, which I showed earlier, and then the K3 came out uh, 22 years ago, I think it was now. No, I'm sorry, 14 years, I think it was. And I have uh, K3 number 43, so it was the first uh, day that they were sold in Dayton. I picked up mine. And then the Elecraft Portables came out, the K1, the KX1, the KX2, and the KX3. And I've owned a number of those radios over the time. Uh, MFJ had a group of monoband radios, and they also had the Cub series, so they had two different MFJ radios out there. The Index Labs QRP was a very interesting radio, and recently the ICOM 705 came out. Also, Zygu came out with the X6100 this uh, fall, and I just got my Christmas gift. That It arrived last week, and I've only had a short time to play with it. There were also a number of simple kits that were very influential in the QRP field, including uh, a whole expansion of monoband uh, CW-only radios, such as the NorCal, Small Wonders Lab, Oak Hill Research, and Wilderness Radio. And many of the NorCal radios were the foundation of what later became the Elecraft radios. There was, has recently been a rehash of monoband kits, uh, cheap uh, versions available from China, such as the Pixie. I recently bought a package of 10 Pixies delivered to my house for under $22. Uh, so I'm going to build one with my grandson and play around with uh, some other friends here and let them build these little simple kits. There's also a variety of KX3 type of knockoff radios out there, and I put the Zygu in that family. Uh, but there's also some other very... Uh, generic type of knockoffs. The Ubix series, the QCX series, and now the QCX Plus and the QCX Mini are all other radios. And here's my, uh, back to my Tentec Power Mic. And here's some other pictures of the whole Power Mic series and some of the ads for it. Here's an Argonaut 505. My children, when they were about when they were toddlers, when we would go to Hamfest, we'd be able to spot a Tentec radio and come running to me uh, to let me know that there was a, an Argonaut or another Tentec radio. Here's the uh, original ad for the 505. It's very interesting. Before they came out with the 505, Jack Birchfield and Albert Kahn actually ran, had an article in November 1971 CQ. They talked about the radio they were going to be releasing called the uh, Argonaut. But they also gave you ideas if you wanted to build your own similar type of radio. So the article is very interesting if you get a chance to look at it in CQ Magazine, November 1971. Here's the ad for the uh, Argonaut 515. I guess mine was about $429. I think I got it for, I thought I got it for $397, but I may be mistaken on that. Here's the uh, Heath Kit HW8, also known as the Hot Water 8 very popular kit it was a four band radio 80s 40 20 and 15 it also had all the microphonics you could stand if you smack the table it would ring in your ears through the headphones and it was rather low priced even uh, in olden dollars when you converted it was not that expensive so the hw8 the hw7 was its predecessor and uh, hw8 was a vast improvement they were both direct conversion receivers, similar to what the uh, Tentec Power Might was. The HW8 was was uh, replaced by the HW9, which was a super hydrodyne, as opposed to a direct coverage. The Northcal 40 QRP radio. Notice Wayne Burdick, who was one of the founders of Elecraft, and this is really one of the foundation tools in the development of the Elecraft series.
the rock mites, a 40 meter CW QRP only radio was very convenient to pop inside an Altoids, t Altoids tin. Uh, the uh, Dave Benson K1 SWL had a series of radios uh, originally designed as the New England QRP NE4040. Uh, it was later updated and sold as the SW Plus. And there was kits available for 40, 80, 30, and 20 meters. They were monobands. Oak Hill Research uh, was founded by Doug Dumas, W1FB, often called the godfather of QRP. Wonderful meter. I have one of these meters in my shack. I actually have two of them, and one's in my shack, and I use it all the time. So Wayne Burdick... Uh, Quote, his aircraft grew out of an extended conversation with Eric Schwartz and I were having about whether a modular transceiver could be designed that would emulate the very popular do-it-yourself PC. The idea was to have a basic radio that could be customized as needed by the user. Could this lead to a successful startup? And yes, it did. It led to the K2. The first design, the K2, which was represented as synthesis of our two philosophies. I designed other QRP radios, including the NorCal, the Sierra, and the SST. I wanted the K2 to be easy to build and operate, small in size, very power efficient, and have a clean, visually appealing design. Eric was a DX enthusiast and consequently wanted the K2 to have an excellent receiver performance and big rig operating features. So the K2 came as a basic CW kit with a variety of optional models available. The K1 was much smaller. It was portable radio with CW only, and it was available mainly as a three band, but there was also some rare four bands, which I had one of. I actually won it at a QRP uh, dinner in Dayton, and uh, I built that. It was a fun thing to build. And then the K3 came out. The original K, the whole idea of the K3 is it was available as a 10 watt radio with an optional 100 watt module, although most of the people that bought it went with the 100 watt module. Mine is an original 10 watt model. Here's a picture of the K2, picture of the K1, here's the K3, here's the KX1 which was designed as a field radio, and the KX3, KX2 which is a little bit smaller. It also lacks 160 and 6 meters but it's about two-thirds the size of the KX3. And it really is a handheld radio. You can turn, put a whip antenna on it, turn it on its side. And this little tiny hole right here is actually a microphone right next to this dial. And you can actually use the push to talk button on the front of it. And I did that recently on my train trip out west. I pulled out my radio on the platform and worked some of the uh, California CUSO party, both phone and CW. Uh, the Ubix is a Indian radio. And... Uh, it's available as a kit for under $160 without the case and without the microphone. And it is really a radio that takes advantage of the microprocessors. Uh, the QCX series from QRP Labs. This is the original QCX. They also have a smaller version now and the QCX Plus. I think I have a picture of those. Uh, the QCX is an easy to build single board, high performance uh, radio, uh, single band. It uses an S. I5351A synthesized VFO with a rotary encoding tooting. It has a blue dis LCD display on it, ambic keying with a stray keyer uh, or stray keyer in the firmware, uh, simple DSP assisted CW decode displayed real time on the screen. And the micro switch right on the radio can be used as a simple straight Morris key. And the newer version, the, QS, the QCX Plus, is still the same price. About $55 for the kit without the, the enclosure. Now here's an example of uh, these little pixies available on eBay. Don't be surprised if some of the components are wrong on these. And it's as a front end brought as a doorway. So if you have a, on 40 meters, you'll hear a lot of broadcast stations. But there, it's a fun little radio to build. And as I said, with my 11-year-old grandson, it's going to be a project for him uh, after he's done some basic soldering on just some sample stuff, we're going to actually build something that does something. This is a list of all the QRP, or not, or many of the QRP clubs out there. The two really biggies are the QRP ARC, the Q, GQRP club in England, but it's actually a worldwide club, and the QRP ARCI in the U.S. And again, all these are links, so you can simply click on them, and it'll take you out to the website uh, for more information on each of these groups. 
I have another slide show presentation. I talk a lot about top secrets of operating, and a lot of the things I talk about in here can help you be a more successful QRP operator. And as I said earlier, all the links for all the slideshows are available for this with this slideshow if you go to tiny.cc slash QAR QAR. If you need a PDF version for some reason, you can click on this link in the slideshow and it'll give you a PDF version of it. Otherwise, these are all Google slideshows because I'm always making updates on them. This is my contact information. This is a picture of my shack without me sitting in the front of it like I am right now. Um, and you can see right down this corner is my K3. Over here is a 991 and a 590. So I do use other radios. Here's a Zygu uh, 90, which I've now sold and I've replaced with the Zygu 6100. This is a link to all my slideshow presentations, and I'll bring that up real quick here. Since the pandemic started, I've been doing slideshows for people around the world, and including your club, for example. And I keep a list of the slideshows, some of the recordings that are available, and some other ex ex extra resources for some of these. So you can see I have information on contesting, buying radios, CW and operations, field day operations, FT8 and FT4. I even have a cookbook here that has nothing to do with radios, uh, gifts for amateur radio operators, broadcast history, uh, logging software, QRP, which we're seeing tonight. Notice the same link as we're using here. QSLing, uh, pandemic operations, uh, portable operations, a group called the Rat Pack. And the Rat Pack has uh, sessions every Wednesday and Thursday that are available to anyone that wants to attend them. They have done over, last night was the hundred and 60th they did that one last night 159th was me on Wednesday night and there's a, all these are available you can watch the videos download the materials view the slideshow uh, for over 160 uh, presentations and you're always welcome to join them live these are the upcoming sh uh, presentations they're going to be doing and for those of you that were seeing my trains in the background my wife and I did a presentation on amateur radio uh, and our travel and uh, trains and uh, associated things with when we go out. We operate field day from a different state each year. We try and hit the small states that don't have a lot of a, a lot of people in them. And we also try and combine trains with our trip when possible. So one year we actually went out to Montana on Amtrak and did a loop around the entire U.S. But the whole idea was to go out to Montana and operate for field day at uh, East Glacier. And then I have some slideshows on uh, youth involvement, also on Worked All States and DXCC. So that's all my slides. So what I'd like to do now is I'll stop my screen sharing, and I'll be happy to take any questions, comments, et cetera. So let me drag this back. And I'll put the link here in this chat for the whole, for all my slideshows. Anthony, a number of years ago, um, International Crystal Corporation uh, actually started before Solid State. They actually had yes. um, a crystal oscillator. And at first it was run on one, a single tube, and then one or two transistors later on. And people used that for QRP. And they were uh, running all sorts of power. It was a wild amount of power, running about 10 milliwatts. Um, yes. The, uh, it was a one inch square crystal oscillator and you run it off a nine volt battery. Somewhere in the junk pile upstairs in the attic or in the, uh, in the warehouse, uh, warehouses, I have one somewhere buried. I wish ah. I could it again. The thing about it was you could drop almost any crystal it came in multiple bands, but you could drop a crystal in there and it would cover 80, 40, and um, back then 80, 40, and 20, I think. And then you change band to 20, 15, and 10 or something. It was it was super wide band, and but uh, it was just really unique. And people operated QRP and uh, worked DX all over the place with that. I mean, just throw up a wire and go after it. Yes. It was really interesting. I remember those. Anybody have any questions for Anthony? He's free. He's paid for tonight. 
Somebody has to have something besides, you know, what's the secret of running a one watt contest station? Hi, this is Steve, KG5 ICR. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, Steve. Yes. Yeah, so what a great presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that tonight. Um, you know, 160 meters for most of us that live in small patches is like the Holy Grail at times. And uh, you talked about your 160 meter reception. Can you talk a little bit about the antenna that you're using? Yes, I'll be happy to. I'm, I'm going to bring up that. I'm going to find that slide and bring it up here real quick. All right, I'm going to go back on mute and let you do your thing. But thank well, you so much for for this evening. This yeah, while I'm doing this, if there's any other questions, it's going to take me a, a, a couple seconds to find the slide I want here. But uh, so if anyone else has anything they'd like to ask me while I'm finding this. I think it's in the slide. So I noticed you didn't, this is Glenn, WB4KTF, while you're looking. I noticed you didn't include the new Russian Lab 599 TX500 QRP radio. Of course, you know, it's 10 watts, but... Yeah, I've ran out of I run out of space. There's so many now. the The whole idea of the um, the use of microprocessors to run these radios has really made the ability to have you know design radios is so much easier now. So there's just a proliferation that sort of outstrips my ability to cover them all. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's my uh, QCX Mini. Yes, great radio. Nice radio. I thought I had that in this slideshow, but I might not. Let me see where I thought it was in this one. Yes, I do. Okay, here we go. Let's go ahead and share the screen. This is my. Um, let me drag this over so I can share my screen here. So this is my view of my property. I'm on a. 74 by 167 foot property so it's not real big i was able to squeeze an antenna a tower in the only place on my property that I had room for it i have a 50 foot uh tower with a uh a, a, a multi-band beam on it the summer xp uh xp 508 it covers uh six meters to 30 meters and it has a 40 meter rotatable dipole at the end of it here so it actually does 40 also I have a DX engineering 40, 43 foot vertical that you can't see because of the trees, but it's approximately right there where the X is at. Now, when I put this slope rope, I was hoping to increase my ability to work the low bands and it worked okay on, on 40, works great, pretty good on 40, works okay on 80, but I was still not able to really get into Europe on 80 with my five watts. So what I did is I added an alpha delta uh, AB sloper and so there's two legs. One is a 66 foot leg with a loading coil in it that you can't see. And the other one is a leg without a coil in it. That's the 80 meter sloper end. And the 160 and 40 meter sloper end is off this side. This comes down to about uh, six or eight feet off the corner of my driveway. Uh, it actually ends about here. That's the feed line that goes over that far. Once I put up this 80 meter sloper, and this is pretty much oriented towards Europe, I was able to get into Europe a lot easier on 80 meters. And uh, it really also was much better on 160 than the vertical was when I was feeding it. So I'm not using a whole lot. This is just a 60 foot piece of wire basically with a loading coil in it, uh, starting at 50 feet and going down to eight feet, oriented basically towards the Southwest. But the trick on 160 is getting on during the contest when people have fabulous receive systems. You know, N0NI, Tony out in Iowa has no problem hearing my five watts and we make regular contacts but he's also got miles and miles of uh antennas out there and you might just notice it up popped a are you seeing a screen for my ft8 i just worked ka3 on 160. um ft8 is a wonderful way to work 160 in addition to working on cw on 160 but ft8 is a great tool for people with marginal antennas so hopefully that answers your antenna question any other further follow-up on that Oh, sorry, I was on mute. No, that, that's a beautiful setup that you have, and thank you for showing that to us. I really appreciate that. 
I am sitting right, I actually, I took turned the screen share out, but I'm actually located right, my shack is right here. We added this room on the back of our house. So my shack is actually located right, located right here in this room. So I actually have uh, a view out through the sliding glass door to the tower, but it's dark here now. This is part of the uh, top secrets to DXCC and worked all state slideshow. And I really talk a lot about operating techniques that apply not only to QRP, but also to QRO. And that's one of the things I found over the years is because of my operating on QRP, when I go somewhere and work uh, a QRO station, it sort of feels like I'm shooting fish in a barrel and uh, it feels like it's unfair advantage. So I was down at the, uh, two years ago, I was at the uh, Hamvention Hamcation, I'm sorry, Hamcation in Orlando. And on Sunday afternoon, things were a little bit slow. So I went into their special event station operator for a little while. And they were very impressed with my ability to run stations on power. And I said, you know, I'm not used to running a whole hundred watts here. This is like too much power for me. Other questions or comments? David, you're muted. Let's try this again. Is this any better? Yes. KA5BBD. David in uh, Houston, Texas. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I just want to. I want to know about the train trips too. <laughs> That's all. Well, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna give you a quick preview here. So let me just drag this over again. I'll bring up another slideshow real quick, and I'll just show you what you can. Which you can see, and it, it, I'm, as I said, my wife and I are planning on doing this, uh, presenting this again. We did it for a group in England, and we did it for a group in um, in Maryland, in Virginia. But we're going to be doing it for the QSO QSO Today Expo that Eric Guth, Guth runs uh, coming up in March. So this is mixing amateur radio with field day and trains, and uh, we talk about our trip to Scotland, which I won. Uh, via an amateur radio contest and uh, then we took a trips around there this is the York uh, National Railroad Museum uh, by the way that's me much younger standing on the uh, in the eastern and western hemispheres at the same time at Greenwich uh, but our really our first really big trip that we did involving trains also was Amtrak uh, in 2009 we went all the way around the country and uh, we basically started in Cleveland went out the glacier and operated at East, at East Glacier for Montana for the uh, field day. And then we went all the way to Portland, down to Los Angeles, across to um, New Orleans, and then up to Washington, D.C., and then back home. Uh, we traveled for 17 days. We just got done doing another run this last, uh, this last October. Left Cleveland, went out to uh, Emeryville, uh, California, in the, in the Bay Area. Um, and on the way out there, I wanted to maintain my record of working all the, Q the QSO parties for the QSO party ch state challenge. And uh, unfortunately, by the time we got to Emeryville, the contest was going to be over for the California QSO party. So in Colorado, I got off in Glenwood Springs with my KX2 and my AX1 antenna and made two, three contacts into California uh, uh, on CW and... Uh, so I got my contacts I need. I need a minimum of two. But then when we were in Sacramento, I got out again and operated as an in-state uh, station in the QSO party, uh, California QSO party, and made a couple more contacts. And then the contest ended right after that. We took that trip, came right back home again. And then we had a few days left on our pass, so we went to Washington, D.C., and then all the way up to uh, St. Albans, uh, Vermont, and then back down to Springfield and then back home. So we... Uh, we did those trips just for the sightseeing. We really didn't have destinations in mind as much as the trip. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to take just this portion of the trip from Denver out to Glenwood, uh, Glenwood Springs is fabulous part of the trip just to see. That's what I was told. That's what I'd like yeah. to do. So this was our first trip and I haven't even got the stuff together for our, our, our next trip in here yet, but we've, we tend to squeeze all sorts of, amateur radio activities in uh, this was during the Pennsylvania QSO party we went out to east, we went out to East Broadtop but on the way out there we also stopped at the Horseshoe Curve in Altoona 
And East Broadtop, unfortunately, that unfortunately now they're not doing this, but they used to run a fall festival where they ran all their trains. They're no longer operating. This is the only narrow gauge, the furthest, uh, the only narrow gauge in the east that was still running. And we did that. Then we went up to Shelburne Village in Vermont and operated up in Vermont um, near Mount Washington. We've also been down to uh, down to uh, West Virginia a number of times. Oh, we stopped at WA1W on our way back from Acadia. Um, and we went down to West Virginia and operated from Seneca State Forest, which is about 40 miles south of the National Radio Observatory. And if you ever get a chance to visit that, that's another neat place to visit. But I, we were in a house, we were in a um, uh, cabin with a propane refrigerator, a wood stove and a compositing toilet and no power at all but that was no problem because i had my solar generator solar panels and my batteries with me and i'm here i'm operating my kx3 um unfortunately that night this is this is what i looked like because i had taken my medication that i wasn't supposed to take if i wanted to stay up all night and by about one in the morning i was very loopy and unfortunately 80 meters was just opening up but i wasn't available to operate so we've done a number of things. This is Cass Scenic Railroad in West Virginia, another great place to operate, uh, another great scenic railroad to visit. It's a logging railroad that climbs up in the mountains with geared locomotives, both Shays and Climaxes and Hesslers. Uh, Western Maryland, I have a friend that's a ham AA8V that lives in Frostburg, and there's a scenic railroad, uh, the Western Maryland, that runs from... Um, Cumberland to Frostburg, so we'd go down to visit him and then operate at his house. On our way to the Hamcation, we stopped at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Um, by the way, this very interesting pink, pink locomotive here is a steam locomotive that has no firebox. They would pump the steam into it, then send it out to operate in an area where there was uh, explosives and highly conductible and highly flammable objects. So it was a steam locomotive with canned steam. So it's basically a giant thermos. And of course, Hogwarts when we were down in Orlando for the Hamvention. And this is our scenic railroad, the local one. This is me in my uniform. And here's where our scenic railroad is at. Uh, basically here between this area, Bedford and uh, Akron, going through the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And this was our 2021 trip out. And this is me operating on the platform in Colorado. So please feel free to stop in for the QSO um, Today Expo and, I, and watch my wife and I present on that. So does that answer most of your train questions? Yes, it does. And thank you very much. It's been a well, very interesting discussion. Thank you. I can think of a few that you missed there in the, the four corner areas, the, uh, the Durango and the, uh, oh, what's the other one there? T t yeah, t t uh, begins with a T. Yeah, that's one of my, that's on my to-do oh, list. Oh, that's. Okay. Yeah, Toltec. That's okay. one of my to-do lists. We're going to operate from New Mexico one year and do Toltec and uh, Durango and Silverton. Those are some great lines. Yes. I was able to see the Durango and Silverton in operation, but not able to ride it. Uh, back in 1981, my wife and I drove out to California and then up to visit a college roommate in Boulder. And we got to see it, but unfortunately, we didn't have time to take a trip. So our, our trip is planned to net we try and operate from states that don't have a lot of operators, so we're going to go to New Mexico and operate field day and take a trip on that. Okay, the uh, old tech is a great one to take. A lot of uh, uh, roads alongside it, uh, if you take it up as far as Coombers. Beyond Coombers, you don't see much. Yeah, so we're, we're, that's, that's definitely on our to-do list. Could you put up your website again? I don't have to get in. I'm sorry, what was the question? Could you put up your website again? Yes, it's K A Z T. It's, uh, I'll put it in the link in the chat here. So it's in the chat, and also there's a link in the chat for my slideshow presentations. Okay. 
the last train uh, that I did was at uh, uh, in Nevada, Virginia City. Okay. Very nice short trip. Any other questions? Just another train comment. The uh, rural, was it rural next to the rural TV channel? Monday afternoon, Monday evening. Yes. Uh, a pretty good uh, train video. Some of them get kind of old, but uh, there's some, uh, some, uh, some good videos show up there. Yeah, my wife and I enjoy watching that. We especially enjoyed the one that went through all the out Australian outback. Yeah, it's RFD TV is what it is. Okay. Anybody have any more questions for, for Anthony? It's a great Great presentation, lots of information. We really appreciate you uh, taking your time out. And uh, absolutely, thanks and for coming out. I appreciate it and uh, it's making me get interested in QRP. Try it, you'll, you, you'll make it hooked. <laughs> I've got a full QRP station in a um, Pelican case. Uh, with an 817 and a tuner and everything. And it's bounced around with me, uh, Australia, and uh, a few places here in the U.S. So it's not used very much, but I still carry it with me and throw it open every now and when I can. I still have my original 817, and I, I, it's pretty much only, I use it now as my uh, low Earth orbit uh, satellite station. So I go out and operate portable satellites with that and an aero antenna. It works very nicely for that. Yeah, a lot of people have them for all sorts of reasons for the 817. It's a great little radio. Anybody have any other questions? Please come now. If you're just looking to start out the QCX, if, if you want a, a CW only one single band radio, the QCX is really a great way to start out because it has very good performance, very low battery requirements. I just read you can, uh, I think you can modify them for sideband as well or something like yeah, that. The, well, there's the, the, the UCX, the UCX project where there's a whole bunch of, and that's, uh, let me show you, let me demonstrate real quick something here. I'll just bring up the screen share again. There's this whole group of them out there that you'll find on eBay right now. And some of these are really garbage, but they are based on, um, let me bring up that slide here, that page here. But some of them, I mean, it would be fun to experiment with them, but a lot of them are not great operating radios. So it's not necessarily the radio we want to start out with, but. Okay, like this, this five band, uh, USDX, USDR, HF radio is using that. It's a modification of the original QCX plans for for single sideband instead of CW. And a, a, a number of people have done this. There's a whole milling group on it, uh, on the UCX milling group. Uh, let me just pick up the milling group here real quick. The U, it, the Mullen Group is 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 micro SDX or UD, USDX, USDX, and they have a whole Mellon Group on that whole idea. DL2MAN has made some uh, boards available for it if you want to build your own. Now, what you could do is you could buy one of these uh, Chinese clones and tweak it, but it just realize it's going to require some tweaking. They're not a, they're not going to necessarily. If you're looking for a radio to immediately operate, they have a lot of issues with them but if you're willing to play around with it a little bit and tweak it they they actually are usable but you can build your own even for less than this if you're willing to follow the mailing list and some of the kits that are out there 
They're not that involved inside. The boards are pretty simple. This is the homepage of DL2MAN, and he has this uh, information on building your own uh, true, he calls it the, the true uh, uh, micro SDX. And he talks about the boards and the printed housing and everything. And um, it's a multi band QRP radio that operates single sideband. He doesn't have any pictures on here. I thought he had pictures of it. Maybe this right. Yeah. No, he doesn't have pictures of the boards. But there are a lot of radios like that out there. Um, that Pixie I showed you that I said are under $202. They're not really the radio you're going to want to use. They're more of a novelty type of thing. If you're looking for something QRP only and you don't want to spend this $1,300 for this ICOM 705, and by the way, when you spend the set $1,300 then you get to spend a little bit more money for a antenna tuner because it doesn't have one built into it. Something like the Saigo uh, ZEXIGU uh, 6100 is available for under $700. I got mine for actually a little under $600 and it's an 160 through six meter uh, digital display, um, waterfall scope. Here, let me bring that up on the... The only thing is it's a new radio and as the case is often when new radios are still playing around with a lot of the firmware. So this is uh, the Zygu or Shigu. And it's got a digital waterfall display, band scope, single sideband CW. I think it puts out, I'm not sure what the maximum power is. I operated at five watts. I think that might be the maximum on this particular one. Um, but as you notice, the firmware has been rolling out pretty quickly here. And fortunately, they've updated a few things that were problems in the first one. But I got mine last week, and it does seem to work very well. I had to do a firmware upgrade to get it to go down uh, to the to the tenth of a kilohertz into the uh, one kilohertz range on tuning because it wasn't doing that. It's got a built-in antenna tuner, built-in battery that you can recharge and operate in the field. Comes with a microphone. And I've just got a QCX mini kit that I just, just received and looking forward to building. It's it's a great little kit. It's the, all the way from Turkey. Yes. Yes, Hans is um, Hans is a, a British citizen that lives in Turkey and he runs QRP Labs. I can bring up the QRP Labs website here actually. How long did yours take between the time you ordered it and uh, you received it? About a week. It's not bad. No, it's not bad at all. So I think the along with the uh, the case it cost me less than hundred dollars. Yeah, this is it right here. This is the QCX uh, QCX Plus. I'm sorry, that's not the mini. You know what? I always never can find the mini on his website. It's not. There it is. So this is the the built version in the iodized uh, aluminum case. That's basically the same circuit as the QCX Plus and the QCX or Classic, just miniaturized. Yep. I'm not looking forward to that quadrifiller filter though, that toroid. This is the one that everyone always complains about. This is the tricky one. <laughs> but he does a lot of very innovative things like um, using this washer and nut to do the heat sink on the four transistors for the output. That, but you notice there's not a lot of soldering to do on here because the 
service mount components come pre-mounted on this particular radio. So it's mainly a, a lot of mounting the of the uh, the coils, winding of the coils. And it stacks on top of itself. Yeah, CW only not only five watts. But they perform very well. I've I've played around with mine and even in contest, it holds its own. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Ronnie, please come now. Anthony's uh, are you East Coast, East Eastern Time Zone? Yes. Okay, so. But I'm retired, and, and time means not, I have no idea. You know, the first skill you lose when you get retired is you lose how to use the ca calendar, and then eventually you forget how to use a clock also, <laughs> <laughs> which is very convenient for if you want to operate 160, you can stay up late at night or get up early in the morning. Retirement is a series of Saturdays punctuated by a Sunday. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I retired a little bit before she did. And when she retired, I said, now kiss, kiss all holidays and weekends goodbye. They're, you're not going to get any anymore. <laughs>